so let's start. And first of all, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a data scientist in an Italian startup named Vidrai. Uh, we propose different solutions for our clients in the field of um, artificial intelligence. And uh, one of our product is the application which help our clients to manage um, the production. So it helps to monitor consumption, uh, warehouse, helps to um, allocate resources. And one of the main thing that it helps is to do predictive maintenance. And we achieve some results in this field and I would like to share with you uh, what we did. And uh, here we will look, uh, first of all, what is the maintenance, uh, the main steps of developing the workflow, and uh, check how it works in uh, the real example. And, uh, okay, let's start. <laughs> um, the world uh, we live in today is highly dependent on the machines or the systems that control these machines. And uh, unfortunately, the machines are uh, a subject to wear or fail. And nowadays there are free uh, maintenance program, which are rent to fail maintenance, preventive maintenance, and predictive maintenance. And let's talk first of all about all these free one by one. So uh, the first type is run to fail maintenance program. And uh, it is the most traditional type of maintenance and it occurs when the failure is already occurs. And uh, probably it can be applied in some simple scenarios, for example, when the light is burned, but in the complex scenarios, uh, it's inefficient because the downtime period um, can in decrease really the efficient of the plant and equipment. The second one is preventive maintenance. And here uh, we schedule the maintenance. And uh, probably the most fo famous scenario is uh, when you have a car, you had to change the oil every 15,000 kilometers. It can be uh, done. <laughs> Uh, not the oil, the <laughs> predictive, uh, preventive maintenance. But in this case, some, um, some uh, unuseful correction are applied. And probably we increase the costs which are uh, not useful at all. And, uh, oh, sorry. The last one is predictive maintenance. Here we try to analyze the health of the machine. Uh, according to all the values, uh, all the sensors, and try to predict the optimal time to do this maintenance. And this is the most efficient um, program nowadays. And <coughs> we can understand that the main challenge in this uh, maintenance program is to predict the time when the maintenance had to be done. And if we predict it really early, uh, we will have unusable time and increase the cost. If we predict it too uh, late, we will have the breakdown and also increase the cost and increase the downtime period of the equipment. So um, the main predictive maintenance benefits are improve e equipment efficiency, eliminate downtimes, reduce cost expense, get higher customer uh, satisfaction sometimes, and sometimes reduce environmental impact. So we understand that it's a good thing, but why we start to talk about this right now? And the answer is quite simple, because of the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, due to the digital transformation, uh, information technology, due to the computer control, now we are able to collect a huge amount of data and we are able to uh, process it and analyze and visualize. So now we know what is predictive maintenance, why it's really good, uh, how we can, that we can do it nowadays. And so the last thing to understand is how to do it. And before, uh, 
checking the real model, machine learning model and artificial um, intelligence. I think that the most important part is try to understand um, what we need and translate it in the machine learning language. And when we do um, predictive maintenance tasks, we try to uh, reply for three questions. The first one, is my machine working normally? And in this case, we can analyze uh, sensors, analyze the behavior, the health of the machine, and apply some anomaly detection algorithm to understand if there is something uh, which are going wrong. Uh, once we detect some abnormal behavior, uh, the second question can be, what are the causes of this abnormal behavior? And in this case, we can try to do some feature selection algorithm or after we can apply some explainability uh, methods. And uh, the last question is, how long is left before the machine breaks down? And in this case, we can try to model the regression models and estimate uh, the, the, the days. Uh, the remaining useful life. And, okay, <laughs> now we can start to talk about technical things. And the, uh, the workflow seems quite simple and quite standard. First, we had to gather the data, processes, make feature selection or feature engineering, then train the model and deploy it. However, in this workflow, it's quite difficult, the first three parts. And now we will see why and what we should do. So, as I mentioned, the first part is uh, data gathering and data preprocessing. And uh, in our experience, we, uh, we saw some challenges, and uh, I will talk about this. The first one is sensor selection. All the machines are a lot of sensors, and they are positional, pressional, temperature, and a lot, a lot. And we need really uh, some technical engineer to understand which are useful for our model and which are not so useful. The second one, uh, step is sensor data collection. And this is a great pain. <laughs> uh, practically, uh, first we had to understand uh, the aggregation. It can be one second, five seconds, one day, one month. and. Um, this depends uh, highly on the model that we want to achieve at the end. Uh, we had to understand how to work with missing data and downtime period. And this, there is a huge amount of missing data, mostly because uh, downtime period of the faulty machines or simply because of weekend, because the plane usually doesn't work mm, during the weekends. And um, the last uh, and probably the most important part is labeling. And um, here we had to collect breakdowns. And probably the more important, it's not only collect practical events of the breakdown, but it's also important to assign if it was, again, as good as before, or a bad, as bad as uh, before. That means that if uh, the broken piece was replaced and now it's really good, or it's just repaired and uh, can be broke uh, again. So uh, the second uh, main important uh, part is feature engineer and feature selection. Here, uh, usually, we can apply three approaches. The first one is time-based feature engineer engineering, uh, where we can um, um, collect mean, max, uh, standard deviation, and others. The second one is uh, feature engineering frequency-based approach. And here, we can see absolute frequency, cumulative frequency, and others. And the third one is time and uh, frequency-based uh, feature engineering, where we can see the time frequency distribution, spectral entropy, and others. Okay, this is everything good, but practically what I've just said now. <laughs> uh, we try to collect all the sensors that we have, select um, with engineers, 
And after, uh, with uh, the help of feature selection and feature engineering, we try to divide the sensors in normal behavior and abnormal behavior. And usually, uh, the sensors which are static uh, are healthy state, and the features which are uh, s seem strange for us, and this is the cause of uh, faults. Uh, when we collect data, do feature selection, the uh, last and uh, most important part uh, is to select uh, the model. Uh, here we can do, mm, do it in two ways. Uh, the first one, uh, we can try to predict um, our uh, sensors and apply the anomaly detection on the prediction. And uh, in this case, uh, so the first um, thing that we do is time series forecasting, and we can use some autoregressive model like uh, ARIMA, SARIMA, or a machine learning model like PROFIT, or deep learning model um, like convolutional ne neural networks, which are quite uh, good in this task. And then we apply um, anomaly detection, and in this case, it's uh, a good advantage of this method because uh, we can do it uh, by classification, and in this case we had to have um, labels, or we can do it in uh, unsupervised uh, mode, and in this case we do not uh, need labels, and uh, usually <laughs> we uh, don't have labels. So uh, this is a good approach. Uh, the second approach is uh, try uh, to um, having sensors values and having remaining useful life of the machine, try to uh, model uh, or to do uh, some regression model. And uh, this is the most, uh, the most uh, known method. It uh, exists for a lot of times. And here I'm not talking only about machine learning. Here uh, the normal method which are used for years and years. And the first one is physical-based approach when we try to simulate the values of uh, sensors and machine mm, behavior with machine model. Uh, however, it's not really good because uh, it's difficult to simulate abnormal behavior. So what we need, uh, actually. The second one is experimental-based um, approach. And in this case, uh, it's really costly because uh, you create some stressful tests and understand the limits of your machine. The third, and now it's uh, the most uh, useful and uh, used, is data-driven approach, which is machine learning or deep learning model. Uh, and we tried to create a, a regression model to predict remaining useful life. And the fourth is the hybrid, which is the sum of one, two, of two or three of these methods. Okay, uh, we are talking about theory, and now it's really good also to see something on the practice. Uh, to show really simple, simple example, I select uh, a data provided by NASA Army Research Lab. And uh, practically, it is uh, the data set uh, which consists of 100 in genes and data taken like a snapshot of the cycle. So we have in gene the cycle, several settings, several uh, sensors. There are 30 sensors, I think. And uh, we have also remaining useful life of uh, all in genes each cycle. And uh, now just apply all the workflow that I described. First one, we check the data and uh, we see that some data have increased behavior, another decreased behavior, and uh, some static behavior. And we can uh, here understand that probably the static behavior won't give uh, useful information for our model, and we just eliminate them and uh, work with increasing and decreasing behavior sensors. So then uh, we try to apply some feature engineering or feature selection. And uh, this is the example. And this is the fourth sensor, sensor 
of uh, all 100 in gene, and we can see that at the beginning all the sensors are quite equal, and this is a healthy state of in genes, and at the end we see that they are quite different, and some uh, finish at one point, some at another, and this is a failure state. Uh, we applied time-based approach, so we check mean, max, uh, standard deviation, and uh, root uh, mean square. Probably the first one do, do not provide uh, useful information, but second and third, we can see that after uh, 200, 200, yeah, 200 and, uh, cycles, we can see already abnormal behavior of the sensors. Uh, then uh, we can uh, estimate uh, the general uh, time, uh, how many cycles do usually the engine, and we can see that after 140 cycles there is already some falls and it starts to uh, decrease. And then uh, for the time and frequency domain, uh, we check the distribution, the distribution of values of sensors. Um, by days, by weeks, and we can see that normally uh, it increases uh, during the useful uh, during the life of the engine. And uh, okay, we apply different methods in uh, other use case, but here just to, to give you an idea how it works. And <coughs> uh, then I would like to show you really simple math uh, model. Uh, it can be used like a baseline model, and it's a uh, right regression, and it is useful when you have several examples and a lot of features. And uh, here, uh, after the feature selection and feature engineering, uh, there is only four code model. We do grid search um, um, parameters and uh, do the fit of model and predict. And it's not about how complex the model or how it's good. It's about that uh, if we see uh, the first um, picture, we can see that the feature engineering, so the uh, green line, start to go, uh, um, start to be almost zero. And this it means that uh, this gives an important information for the model to understand how to predict uh, our target. And uh, to be truth, that's all. <laughs> uh, we talk with what is maintenance, how which which is the main part of uh, workflow. Uh, I give you a small overview of the algorithm which can be used and an example. Uh, yeah, that's all. And uh, <laughs> before before mm, the questions and everything, I just uh, would like to say that we are a startup company and we are searching for the developers, data engineers, data scientists. And if you like what we are doing, come. If you don't like this presentation and you think that you can do the better, come. <laughs> we will be really, uh, really thankful. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now is question time. Let me take. Okay. Cool. Okay. So the first one is regarding time series forecasting. By using auto regressive, auto -regressive models, you treat the time series of each sensor separately. Well, sorry. Do you treat each yeah. uh, time series. Well, sorry. Again. <laughs> it's, it's difficult to speak and, and read. So. Um, by using autoregressive models, you treat the time series of each sensor separately. Okay. It is possible to combine the knowledge from multiple series? Uh, this is the question. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, yes, with uh, some models. I explain why we, we do it, uh, how we do it, is because, um, as I said, there is uh, an small advance of this method is that after you can apply uh, an um, uh, unsupervised anomaly detection and uh, we 
saw that um, a lot of clients do not have the data, labeled data, that there was some fault or breakdown. So uh, here we, uh, it's like an iterative work. We try to individuate with clients their main sensors, we try to predict their behavior, try to apply the anomaly detection algorithm. If I'm right, uh, the uh, VAR model try to time series. Um, Multidimensional time series. Yes, but probably I'm, I'm wrong, I don't know. But you're not using that in this case? Uh, okay. Now, no. Okay. Um, can you elaborate mm, on some of the challenges you usually encounter on, at the data collection step or steps? Okay, <laughs> yeah. And um, so I, I had to, to yeah, it's quite broad. <laughs> okay, uh, so practically the, the the first one, so there is a lot of <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> um, the huge amount of data, and uh, you had to understand that usually values are one seconds or five seconds, so it's sixty values in a minute, and uh, I don't know hundreds and hundreds values just in one day, and it is really difficult to elaborate all of them, and we had to understand uh, which maximum aggregation we can allow to um, to provide a, a good um, a good results for our clients. Uh, the second one, uh, there is a lot of missing data, as I mentioned, uh, because of breakdown uh, periods, because someone spent the machine and, uh, and we don't know if it was spent or it was fault. Um, sometimes, uh, okay, also how to, uh, to treat uh, the, the, um, the machine which are not uh, working because uh, there is no need. Um, and we have missing data. Another problem uh, was with other with one of our clients that uh, uh, he has data of faults, but uh, he didn't know how they treat the machine after fault. So sometimes you had just to wait a little bit and the machine start to work normally. Sometimes you had repair, sometimes you had just substitute the the um, the piece of machine and uh, you don't know this information and probably you won't um, know it uh, and uh, this is difficult um, so what else um, the t talking about technical stuff uh, I, I'm not working with it but I know that there is uh, different uh, um, protocols to, to talk between machines and uh, uh, try to understand which sensors, what knows, and the values. And uh, this is difficult to, um, to collect real data in the sense that you had to attach to the machines and collect in some way this data. And um, sometimes it's decryption, sometimes it's... Uh, uh, MQTT protocols that you had to, to write. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not working with this part because it's more engineering, but I know the, the difficulty. And another big challenge uh, for us is to explain the results for our client. And in, in this case, uh, why we do not use really difficult models, because after you had to, to say this, works in this case, um, we, uh, we, determ we think that will be some downtime, but we don't know why. So we use usually some decision tree algorithm because here uh, you can in some way explain to the client uh, why we think that will be a downtime. Okay, <clears throat> next question is, I have you tried libraries for feature extraction from time series like TS Fresh? No. no. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Brainstorming session now. So, uh, labeled data could be limited, as you said. Did you generate any synthetic time series data like oversampling? Yeah. Uh, based uh, on the data yeah, you yeah, already yeah. have. 
Sure. Uh, or yes, bootstrapping, we, I would call it that. yes, we can do oversampling. I'm sorry, I didn't mention this. Uh, another, um, so uh, as I said, the, the real problem that we do not actually have level data. And uh, for example, now what we are doing is um, trying, uh, like we, had, uh, we have an app and uh, we notify the client that we think that there is some uh, anomaly and then the client can uh, just check, see uh, um, yes or no. And uh, in this case, we start to uh, collect data, label data, and the next step will be <laughs> oversampling in case uh, we have not enough um, labeled positive data, positive in sense of uh, shutdown, faulty. Do you deploy your models in production or do you mainly perform historical analysis? Uh, yes, <laughs> it's better <laughs> ask another my colleague about it. Uh, we use uh, OS uh, yeah. like cl cli uh, cloud uh, provider. We use MLOps uh, for uh, MLflow for uh, production. We use Git te technologies for S SISD. Okay, w which metrics do you use to evaluate anomaly detections models? Okay, so uh, um, usually F1 uh, because there F1. is no so much anomalies in case we have. Now, as I said, uh, we send the notification and um, we um, the client can uh, reply if it's real anomaly or not. And uh, by this we, we can also calculate the accuracy. Um, yeah, but practically, they are recall uh, accuracy F uh, F1. Okay. Uh, so many questions. <laughs> we have last two minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I feel myself like in the exam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, maybe I, I can come up with one. Uh, because you mentioned profit, which is a Bayesian uh, model for time series analysis, yeah. even though it has, uh, I mean, internally it uses Stan and um, it encodes uh, some features like holidays, I'm talking about like, a day scale, um, so seasonality and, and holidays. So, I mean, do you use any other Bayesian models? Why am I, am I asking that? Because the cool things of Bayesian models is that they give distribution, probably the distribution as an output and maybe is like a better fit for your, your use case. But do you use any Bay other Bayesians? Um, no, and uh, actually we do not use profit because um, it's not really suitable for this small aggregation. It's quite one second, five sec. We are working one with one second, five seconds aggregation. It, uh, it can be applied in this case. Um, we uh, we were using before Arima and Sarima. We do now some experiments with convolutional neural networks and since that also them perform quite good. Uh, the question is how, if we really need so um, complex model to predict one sensors when we, we are working with 100, 500 sensors because you try to predict the t plus one <coughs> value, right? Yeah. And so you're supposing the distribution is kind of a, a normal distribution, which, I mean, deep neural networks or even linear regressions are good fit for that. But for instance, in the, uh, you showed the curve of mm -hmm. the life expectancy, which is usually not a normal, a normal distribution. And so my, uh, my last question would be, do you uh, apply log on that in order to then, uh, fit from the from that distribution to a normal distribution like log uh, yeah um, yes usually yes also because we actually um, really rarely use the real sensors values we do feature selection and feature engineering and uh, apply uh, all the methods like uh, I've said before but also the method that you said <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, guys, thank you very much.